1990 was a fantastic year in PC gaming. The world was honored with the start of Chris Roberts' Wing Commander series. This was released by Origin Systems. Wing Commander is set in the year 2654. Human civilization is locked into war with the Kilrathi, a belligerent race of felines. You're a rookie pilot assigned to the TCS Tiger's Claw along with a multinational roster of pilots from Earth. The greatest strength of Wing Commander was the player's effect on the game world. Instead of the linear level progression format, you had a mission tree where you could win or lose and still move forward with the campaign. This was rare back in the day. Most games would have you try again until you beat the level or you run out of lives or continues. Not Wing Commander. This game revolves around the Vega campaign. You're trying to liberate the Vega sector from the Kilrathi, and your own skills will determine the outcome. You either win the sector, or you lose and retreat, and these are the two endings you can get. These are not spoilers. The only true game over screen is if you die. The gameplay looks fairly straightforward, but it's actually very complex. You have a wide range of spacecraft you can fly in, all of which have differing armaments, missiles, shields and armor. You're unable to choose which spacecraft you can fly. This is predetermined. The controls themselves take up the entire keyboard. There's a key for everything. You need to change to different computer systems very frequently. Navigation, weapons, communications, damage control, targeting. You also toggle differing guns when the option is there, and you carry different types of missiles. Dump fires, heat seekers, image recognition missiles, friend or foe. You have to keep track of all of these things. The complexity of this game is why it's called a space combat simulator. It tries to be as realistic as possible, or at least as close to what it theoretically should be. Switching to these systems is very easy and quick once you memorize the keys. Aiming on a keyboard can be a bit of a hassle. Performing finer adjustments to your aim feels very stiff. Tapping arrow keys seems to have no response, and trying to hold it down long enough ends up overshooting the target. It's one of those things you have to get used to, but you can get around this by aiming with a mouse. Even better still, use a flight stick. After all, you are in a fighter craft. The flight stick and keyboard combo feels so amazing to play with, and it's recommended whenever you're playing any sort of flight simulation game. There is one simple feature that I absolutely adore. There are many parts of the game where you fly through open space and absolutely nothing happens during this period. This is where the autopilot comes into play. This allows you to skip massive amounts of empty space and gets you right into the action. I really like this feature. I hate these boring segments and I'm really glad they implemented this feature into the game. But if you're one of those people who likes flying around empty space all day, you can still do that. No idea why you would want to, but by all means, go right ahead! In between missions is where you see the storyline unfold. You can talk to some of the pilots at the bar for some useful information, and this also serves to provide you with the backstory of the other pilots. Before your very first mission, you can talk to the pilots to find out how to engage the enemy craft and how many shots it takes to destroy them. Very useful information right off the bat. Going to the mission briefing, it's not a simple screen of text describing the mission, but an actual dialogue between characters in a cutscene. The captain assigns the missions and the wingmen here, and the pilots are asking questions about the missions. The graphics here are surprisingly detailed. Smooth animations, 256 colors, there's even a sequence where you're running to your spacecraft with a sense of urgency. There's a few kinds of missions you'll be flying. The most common of these are the patrol missions. Fly to every nav point, see what's there, engage the enemy if you can, fall back if you can't. Destroying the enemy is great, but it's not an absolute requirement here. Gathering intelligence counts as a win, and that's one of the things I like about this game. It's not about racking up the kills, it's about your contribution to the overall war effort. You still receive search and destroy missions, take out an enemy warship, and leave no survivors. The game does have escort missions, but fortunately they follow a preset path rather than following you. The escort missions were done correctly here. Some of these missions were designed to be very hard, almost impossible even. The developers intended you to lose a few missions, 
Nobody is a perfect pilot. If you have to eject or return to the ship without completing the mission, then you just have to do it. To complicate things even further, it's possible for your wingman to die. This goes back to your own skills as a pilot. If you're unable to cover them when they need it, the Kilrothi can gang up on them and they will die, so you're punished with an increase to the difficulty in later missions. This will reflect on board the Tiger's Claw when the ship starts to feel empty and you're assigned to fly solo missions. This is what makes Wing Commander stand out. The story and the gameplay is very dynamic. Any mission can succeed or fail. Anyone can live or die, and this all depends on how well you play the game. The graphics in general is probably the weakest part of the game. Even though it's from 1990, it is what it is. The cutscenes and the user interface, basically all the 2D stuff, that's where the graphics shine. And as I said earlier, the graphics are surprisingly detailed here. It's when they have a negative impact on the gameplay is where we run into problems. All the fighters and ships are represented by 2D sprites with numerous facing angles in 3D space. These are scaled based on the distance, ranging from a few pixels to a moderate amount of detail up close. This works for the smaller fighter craft, but not so much for the larger warships. They take up a larger amount of space, and it's possible to collide with them even though it looks like you can pass. When you're trying to land on the Tiger's Claw at the end of a mission, you have to make sure you're approaching the hangar. That's at the front of the ship. There are times I've crashed into the Tiger's Claw, but fortunately it wasn't enough to kill me. I could fly away and try again. This is a problem with the graphics. It's hard to tell where the hangar entrance actually is, but the detection is flexible enough that it's not a game-breaking issue. It's still a problem that rears its ugly head every once in a while. The game can also slow to a crawl if there's too many objects in the area. Four to five craft is all it takes. The controls start to become unresponsive. Sometimes I have to hold down the fire button for a good half a second just to fire off one shot. It's annoying, but again, it's not a game-breaking issue. The music is separated into a large amount of short clips instead of a few longer tracks. This allows the music to loop a few segments and transition between them depending on the current situation, and this helps to ensure the music doesn't get stale after a while. The sound effects are okay, nothing too special. The guns have the stereotypical pew 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 sound, but everything else is really soft. Maybe my standards are too high, because when something explodes, I really want to hear a loud KABOOM! And this is absent from the game. Wing Commander was ported to a few other systems. The console ports have a drastically different feel to it. The Sega CD port is most notable for its audio. The music was replaced with a completely new soundtrack, and all the cutscenes have full voiceovers. Konnichiwa, Hachat-san. Please, take a seat. If I may say so, you are doing quite well. The sound effects also get an upgrade here. I finally have my loud explosions! The game is playable with three-button controllers, but the controls are much more complicated. To mimic the PC controls, Start is held down to modify the actions of all the other buttons. This works, but it's very slow to use. Cycling through all the systems is a pain in the ass. On a keyboard, you can use C for communications, N for navigation, T for targeting, and you could do this very quickly. On the Sega CD, you have to hold down Start and press A or C to cycle through these systems. It's such a hassle, but you can lessen this annoyance by using a six-button controller. The graphics manages to maintain its level of quality, only the text on your HUD was made larger to make it readable on a TV. The only problem is the slowdown, and this happens with only two to three objects in the area. That aside, this is a port that tries to be faithful to the source material, and it does a good job despite the limitations. The Super Nintendo port tries to do this as well, but to a much lesser extent. One thing that surprises me here is that there's minimal slowdown. You can be up against five or six enemy fighters, and the game will still run at the same speed. But this is probably due to some of the things they changed in this version. We have the Nintendo-style censorship, removing cigars, replacing the alcoholic drinks with snacks, that sort of thing. 
Many of the cutscenes are also less fluid and detailed. Some of these segments were removed altogether, like the second half of the landing sequence. It's not just the looks that are affected. If it was, then this port would be amazing, but it's not. Game speed aside, the gameplay suffers severely here. As with the Sega CD port, the controls are much more complicated. Select is held down to modify the actions of all the other buttons, so it's a similar problem to the Sega CD port. Regardless of how many enemies there are in the area, you can only engage one at a time. That's the problem with this version. I'm not entirely sure if it's because of the Super Nintendo's limitations, but in some ways, it actually cheapens the experience because you have to figure out which enemy you can technically engage. You're essentially playing whack-a-mole here. Most of the time, the right target is behind you, and for whatever reason, you can't simply turn around and get them in your sights. You're taking hits, and you can't dish out the damage yourself until you find the right target. If you were wondering why you were having trouble playing this, that's the reason, and it really sucks. It seems weird to me, but I'm guessing this is some sort of programming trick to minimize the slowdown. I don't think it was worth it, sacrificing the gameplay to maintain its speed? It's a severe enough problem that this port may have turned a lot of people away from the series. This version is also lacking a save feature, so instead, every time you finish a system, your progress is saved in the form of a password. There's no saving between missions. There was a non-playable demo released for the game, but these days we would call it a trailer. It's the engine showing off the gameplay and the cutscenes, and at the time, it showed people something they've never seen before, an immersive gaming experience. There was no playable demo or shareware game available, but that never stopped it from getting out the door. Wing Commander strikes a balance between gameplay and story, if you're a terrible player, you'll be punished for it. Whether you're a good player or not, you'll still be treated to an immersive experience. It's like watching a movie, except with you front and center writing the story yourself. And this formula was further improved upon in the sequel. Wing Commander 2 – Vengeance of the Kilrathi For the sake of the storyline, the winning story from the previous game was considered to be canon, and many of the pilots were kept alive. Wing Commander 2 told a much darker and more mature story, and there were some cutscenes that occurred during the missions themselves. In order to tell this deeper story, many of the original gameplay features had to be thrown out. You had a simplified mission tree, and your wingmen couldn't die. These elements would interfere with the script, the character development, and they would simply make a mess of the story. But the trade-off here was worth it. So with the emphasis on story in Wing Commander 2, one of the new features that augments this is the use of voice acting with the speech accessory pack. Not everything had voiceovers, but the voices in the major cutscenes took the immersion to the next level, more so than the voices in Wing Commander 1's Sega CD port. Speak of your plans, not of your toys. Tell me how you will defeat the Terrans. Yes, my Emperor. Without the Tiger's Claw to defend them, we can crush the rebellion on Gorakar. You even get to listen to everyone talking during combat, and again, this takes the immersion to the next level when you hear the enemy pilots dying in a blaze of glory. You cannot defeat the Drakai! Well, it did. Gameplay-wise, it's still the same game mechanics and controls. You have new craft you can fly in, and some familiar ones as well. Missions can still be won or lost, but there are now fewer branches in the mission tree, and in some cases, a loss will end the game. So now, it's more important than ever to win missions. Again, this goes back to the emphasis on story. Too many paths will result in players never Very seeing impressive. a good portion of the game. So, why bother making it? The graphics have slight improvements, but they remain more or less the same, and the game runs faster. You can have more objects in the area before you notice any slowdown. When you're taking major hits, they become apparent when your equipment is getting busted up. These games were very important for pushing hardware in the market. PC gamers of the time wanted to buy a new system just to play Wing Commander 1, and Wing Commander 2 did something similar for the Sound Blaster card thanks to the Speech Accessory Pack. 
Wing Commander 2 also had a non-playable demo similar to its predecessor, but there were no ports for the game. This was exclusive to MS-DOS, and gamers were still craving for more. Chris Roberts had some content that he was unable to put into the games, and because of his experience with Dungeons & Dragons campaign expansion packs, he thought to do the same with Wing Commander. Each of these was another campaign with 18-20 to 20 missions to play through, but they were much more simplified. You only had one or two chances to win a series of missions before you lose the campaign in its entirety, and this was just the start of an amazing series! The first game strikes a balance between gameplay and story, and the second focuses on story at the cost of some gameplay. In both cases, they tried to deliver an immersive experience instead of just being another video game. And deliver, they did. Some of its attributes do not translate well to the modern era of gaming, like the 2D sprites on the larger ships and the slowdown I mentioned earlier, but the progress in technology allowed the sequels to take the series to the next level.